sourcing rewards. And that means uh, your actions uh, your actions contribute in a way that can potentially lead to rewards. So at about this range, for instance, uh, if your opponent decides to super jump in at you, then if you do Rising JA, you're technically sourcing reward. Now, they could not, they might also not jump at you, but you're doing this JA, this Rising JA anyway, it's still reward sourcing. You're still yeah, trying I, to get something out of it. I think I see what you're going for with this, yeah. Right, yeah, so... Uh, there's that, um, right, and, uh, it doesn't really matter what the reward is, it could be, you know, just a tiny tap, or they, they might, uh, they might block it, or you might get a full counter hit, you know, that's all rewards, right, and stuff like meter gain, or even, like, closing the distance favorably, that, these small things are all different types of reward, and they obviously all add up in their own ways, um, the most notable type of, uh, of reward sourcing in this game usually tends to be from big counter hit starters, uh, pressure, like, you know, being able to start pressure. Like, if you if you get in at, like, maybe uh, this this range or something, and then you start pressure, that's still reward sourcing. And uh, obviously, hit confirming and actually getting off combos, uh, that's also reward sourcing. There's also damage sourcing, which is, as, you know, again, the term implies, uh, you're sourcing for damage. So, if you do this, and you get a full counter hit combo, you get a combo like, like a counter hit starter, that's pretty good damage sourcing. Uh, you know, and if you do your hit confirms properly, uh, let's just say for instance, the enemy didn't block that. Yeah, you get a combo, right? So that's damage sourcing, uh, etc, etc. So, here's the thing with... Actually, shit, I didn't use a different character for this. I, I, hang on. Okay, so there's damage sourcing, and then there's also the thing I'd like to call qualitative limit. What I mean by qualitative limit is uh, it's a characteristic intrinsic to whatever it is you're doing that no matter how good you are, just by the nature of the action itself, you can't avoid that. No matter, you can't avoid that certain characteristic, no matter how good you are. So, let's say, for instance, uh, as a Nania player, you know, I might be really good at mixing things up, right? Yada, yada, yada. Uh-huh. Blah, blah, blah. But if, uh, let's just say, for instance, I am a mid-level Nania player. Every time I get this knocked down, I go for, I go for stance mix immediately after. Now, just to prove the example, I'm going to do 2 4 a or 2 and 4 c and nothing else. This is not a trick question. I'm just going to show this to you. It's either 2 and 4 a or 2 and 4 c and I want you to guess which one I did. Uh, <laughs> Alright, just, just guess. Between those two things, just guess. Which one did I do? Alright, let's say it's the overhead. Wrong. Okay, okay now, now guess again. Now, which one did I do? I'm gonna go with the grab. Correct. Now, let's guess again. Which one did I do? The grab again. Which one did I do? D I'm going to go with the grab. Well. <laughs> okay. okay. So, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, so, this is what I mean by qualitative limit. The thing is, non in stance mix-up is really good. It is. I'm never going to deny that, right? But the thing is, because there's an inherent randomness aspect to it that can't be avoided, like... Uh, me having to guess correctly on command grab, overhead, blah, blah, I have so many options that I can make these things work just by virtue of the opponent not being able to predict everything. But at the same time, the opponent also has pretty broad sweeping options that can deal with at least a handful of these, right? Um, like, let's say if I do overhead, for instance, or if I do command grab, then backdash beats both. But obviously mm, if I do... Uh, not with you her. Know, if, what? Not with her. Okay, well... Yeah, back, that's okay. just like... you're right, you're right. Not with FCL, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Uh, my bad. But the point is, um, the, point I'm, the point I'm bringing here is there's an inherent randomness aspect to this that can't be avoided by either the Nania player or the opponent, right? Or the defender. At some point, I'm going to be right, and at some point, I'm going to be wrong. This is something I talked to uh, Ika about, actually. And uh, the problem I take with Ika's stance on this game is that... He feels like if he guesses harder on the mix-ups, then he's just going to do better. And you know that's not the thing. Like, you know that, that that's basically 
the luck based equivalent of saying, oh, if I train my reaction super hard, I can react to even five frame things. And you know that's not how this works. Right. That's, so right. where are you leading with this? Okay, so what I'm leading with this is, uh, this is something that applies to fighting games at just about every level. Um, so let's say, for instance, uh, something I noticed you do, what's the button? So every time I'm at about this distance, sometimes you don't do this. But oftentimes, when I am at this distance, you do do this. Because at that point, you're usually expecting, like, super jumps or something, right? Yeah. Like, or, or just big air movements in general. And you're trying to prevent me from getting in. And you don't really have anything else to do at this range that might hit, right? No, I mean, there are other things I could do. Like, what, this? Like, uh, just walk forward, dash to a whiff, just the space in a different position. Uh-huh. Or even from that spacing, there is a, maybe a walk in slightly and dash to B. Walk in slightly, dash to B. Okay, that's yeah. fine. I'm that's also good. been good. considering using air dash a little bit now with with B. From like the tip range of B, tip not B. with C necessarily, because B is a little stronger. Ah, uh, okay, okay. It's harder to beat. Saying. But yeah, like, I mean, there are, I understand what you're saying, though, because at two-thirds screen, that's where FCL's B keys are least likely to get killed more than anything. Yeah, least likely to get killed, you know, covers a decent angle, yeah. and for the speed at which it goes, that, that's basically the spot at which you should use it, right? Right. The thing is, right. like, I can't oh. overuse this move. It's not, like, a big reward move regardless. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Because the opponent at any point could just do, uh... If you do this, I could just do this, and boom, I'm in, right? And now you're in a bad spot. Um, so, effectively, where I'm going with this is, uh, actually, there is one more concept I did not cover that would be better exemplified with uh, F-Mech, actually. Since, you know, both owners. All right, so there's this final concept I didn't touch upon. You ever play Dab's F-Mech by any chance? Yeah, many times. Yeah, okay, many times, right? So, what is the number one problem with Dab's F-Mech? It's, it's kind of a similar problem to what almost H. Kohaku had. Well, I feel like when I play Dab's, I feel like Dab's plays too passively. I'm not sure how it is when you play. Okay, um, no, Dab's plays passively against me also, but playing passive also isn't really the Omlo um problem I'm talking about. The yeah. problem I'm talking about is that, uh... You know, they play too robotic, and I, I explained this to both right. of them, actually, and yeah. they seem to be playing a little better now, but uh, when I say in detail, like, what I mean in detail when I say they play I too understand. robotic... So you're telling yeah. me that, alright, if I'm at certain spaces, I'm going to use certain actions. Right, right, there's that, but more specifically, like, the number one thing I'm trying to stress to them here is that in the same key situations, they always approach the same windows of time the same way. Now, what do I mean by windows of time? That is a very, very broad term that can be used to mean any given amount of time, right? Mm. But for, for fighting games specifically, I'm going to use it to uh, me, refer to micro-situational focuses. As in, like, let's say, for instance, when you're playing FCL, uh, you might be standing at this range uh, trying to confirm a super jump from the opponent, right? So that's that's a micro situation. That's one that's one micro situational focus. Because if you're focused on doing this, then you're not like you're likely not focused on the opponent doing uh, whoops, on the on the opponent doing, right? Well, yeah. Or uh, like, right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, oh, and uh, there's there's two things that feed into this. You ever watched that Corey gaming video on the two types of thinking, like thinking fast, thinking slow? Yeah, actually, yeah. I always watch Okay, those. so, uh, regarding System 1 and 2, that's a very real thing as a concept. You have a conscious focus and an automatic focus, because at this range, if you're focused on, like, you know, uh, intersecting with Rising J.A., you're not really likely to get hit by this just because of, like, how slow the startup is, right? Mm -hmm. You see that animation, you immediately shift from a conscious focus to an automatic focus when things don't work out as you anticipated. So... If you're focused on doing this, but the mech does this, then you're immediately going to be blocking that, like, without hesitation. Since you're already on the ground, you didn't jump yet, yada yada, you didn't confirm the super jump, you get it, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, 
uh, ob obviously, these things tend to work in, uh, you know, fractions of seconds or even second intervals because fighting games are fast. There's a lot of small things being confirmed per situation, lots of new adaptations being made, like, and them them showing in very small changes in time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what I mean, now, where I'm going with this and the concept of windows of time is that normally when Dabs plays, what Dabs does is uh, Dabs will do something like, uh, you know, at this range, they'll do like, Oh, not that. Uh, they'll do this, right? Because their their idea is basically, if the opponent approaches, then they have to deal with the, the time bomb, they have to play around that. So their advantage, their pressure, their potential combo damaging might be minimized because they have to, you know, like they have to get away from the bomb. And uh, because, you know, death is at a safe distance, you can sit, set this, boom, it's already out. Not that long. Around 30 frames, pretty long for in and of itself, but yeah. at that range, not that big of a deal, right? Yeah. It is her and, best junk set move in terms of yeah. recovery. Uh huh. So there's that. And uh, if that fails, then, uh, you know, no, not if that fails. Uh, if the opponent's anticipating that, then Dabs can back that up with, aha, now I have you with Rising JA, which is really good on, you know, Beth Mech, right? Yeah, or like uh, that's, that's something, yeah. that's something Dabs often does. And it's not a bad strategy, but the thing I explained to Dabs is that. When Dabs plays exclusively like this, the strategy itself could be working 100% perfectly as intended. Like, if a top player were to take the exact same strategy, add absolutely no spins to it, then they might be doing it just as well as the top player, right? But the problem here is, it runs a qualitative ceiling. And this is the same thing I told Amla, because whenever I fight Amla, he often goes for the same, you know, command grab points, the same pressure. It stops pressure at the exact same ways, etc., etc. Normally, all I have to think versus Amla is kill him in neutral here because he's going to move like this. If he doesn't get what he wants, he's going to do broad escape movements, which I could just pin down. And when he gets pressure, it's usually just guessing between uh, strike throw or if he's out of strike throw range, then he's usually likely to, uh, you know, do more frame traps from uh, mid to full screen, right? Oh, no, sorry, uh, mid screen, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. do his mid-screen Kohaku pressure, and then I usually just wait that out. He resets pressure again? Okay, whatever. No big deal. Th strike throw, uh, the throw resets are telegraphed, and if I happen to be wrong, then so be it. By acknowledging these nuances and knowing how to defend against Amla, you can mitigate his reward sourcing by forcing it to hit its qualitative limit a lot faster. Now, the thing about this is that it's all built on anticipation, as I said. Like, it's all built on knowledge of what they're going to do. And a lot of what uh, conditions that knowledge is different windows of time. So, you know how at, ext at really low levels you do this because players aren't blocking? Or they might be matching, right? Then at mid-levels you do this more often, like you delay. You, you delay more often because, uh, you know... They're likelier to mash, but not in such frame. Uh, sorry, not in such uh, airtight spots. You're you're trying to catch mashes, or you're trying to discourage mashes by doing uh, delay pressure, right? Yeah. And then at really high levels, I did this to uh, Zay and his F Ryoki. This is how he made the the Miyako work up. Like, oh, sorry, uh, the Miyako match of work against that character. But uh, something I did was right. And obviously you know that's because you're conditioning the opponent and playing off their anticipated windows of time. Now, the thing about windows of time is that because fighting games are so fast, you more or less have to be constantly betting on what's going to be, uh, be happening at which windows. Like, you're prioritizing which windows to focus on. When I fight Amla, I only really have to focus on, uh, you know, does he do a repeat? Does he do... Uh, tick throws, and that's it basically. I don't have to really focus on anything else, but maybe the EX guard timing on the strings, which are also pretty linear, right? Right. So, uh, Dabs also has a similar problem because even, uh, you know, even if uh, Dabs does whatever, you know, Dabs things, right, or whatever Dabs things he used to, I guess, uh, he's not really using those windows of time effectively because if I know what he's going to be doing, then I know how to approach those windows of time. Now, the thing that I told Dabs to do is, whenever he's in this spot, I told him, don't set anything immediately, and whatever you do, do not focus on this immediately. Now, you can do it sometimes, is what I told him, but what I really told him to do was wait and see what the opponent does, 
and then play around the next window of time. Instead of... Because obviously, if you're focused on doing this, you don't really have the time to focus on doing this, maybe, right? And if you're focused on doing this, then you're not really focused on uh, being able to do... Right? Because yeah. these things all take... Like, these are all different priorities that require different focuses, and they also require you to, again, play at vastly different windows and this is kind of what i did with the uh, skeleton also actually and what he would do to me uh he kind of figured this out earlier than i did i feel or rather he made better use of it than i did before i could get to that level uh you know how whenever skeleton does like uh skeleton pressure it's like well but assume i block that right and then he'll usually just like wait out here doing absolutely nothing right yeah. absolutely nothing because he knows that the opponent, like he, uh, the opponent eventually has to move, even if only a little bit. At this spot, it's really easy for him to economize on the spacing, which buys him time. And that spacing allows him the time to react to whatever it is I'm doing, blah blah blah. And by standing in that position, doing what he's doing, he's prioritizing and playing in a window of time that's ahead of mine. We're in the same game state. But he's tackling a future opportunity that I've really yet to get to. You you get where this concept's going, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I know all of this. Right, right, right. Okay, so where I'm going with... Okay. All right, in that case, let's just get right to that whole FCL C9 thing. Uh, actually, for sure. Uh, yeah, all right. FCL C9 So you do know all this. Uh, but the thing is, um, normally... I find that in those same windows of time, the things you could be doing better are going for different micro focuses or recontextualizing the situation entirely by, how do I say this? Uh, setting up different spacings, I guess, or different, or, or different, playing off my expectations differently. Because normally, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, food. Um, so you get this concept, but. The thing I don't really see you doing is playing with it as well as you know you can. Like, let's just say, for example, uh, you're right, FCL pressure isn't that immediately threatening because there isn't a whole lot you can do to open me up with, uh, you know, strike throw mix or whatever mm -hmm. I can do as Nanya, right? Um, you can't really enforce real mix-ups the way I can, per se. But uh, something I never really notice you doing, like, uh, I never really notice you playing hmm. what's what's a good way to put this so okay let me ask you let me ask you this whenever you play at this range do you how often do you feel you go for you know like whiff punish oh, no, yeah like stuff like this or or this or whiff punishes as opposed to or chasing me down in terms of movement as opposed to maybe you know uh backing up just a little more just a little more to play at this spacing. I never see yeah. you really play I would play have at... to do that more. Because if I'm at the little closer range that you were at earlier, the threat of Nania hitting me with 2B is way higher. Yeah, it is, right? If There's I step that. back slightly, now yeah. the control is more in my favor. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You're also tackling a different window. And now that I see you moving back, if I don't expect that, my... Uh, what was it? My my automatic mode of thinking is spending a split second catching up to that. Now, because I'm playing a little bit of catch up, you can probably abuse that. Probably, because like if you do this and then you know suddenly, uh, I don't know, walk forward then jump or something, I'm gonna be like, what the fuck is going on, right? I'm not gonna know what the fuck you're doing. You're gonna know what the fuck you're doing because you have the window of time advantage here. You see what I'm saying? A hundred percent, yeah. Right, so there's there's a lot of small things like that, and uh, also the fact that normally whenever I jump out, it's always like keys or like the uh, bad I find. But you never really do anything tricky like uh, run under here, and you might be wondering, oh, but if I do that, you might corner me. And the answer is, uh, my response to that well, is not really. It depends on how you're moving, because a lot of times when people do hop like that, I will do a dash under right. and try to catch right. them from behind, and I'm okay if right. I lose the positioning. But I'm saying, like, when was the last time you anticipated me maybe trying to jump out of the corner, or maybe an opponent doing that in general, and then you saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dash to a whiff here specifically, like this spot specifically, in anticipation of this. Like, you, you never do that, right? 
Well, I wouldn't do it if I know they're going to go, but I would like if that a situation does occur, however. Like, right, right. But that's what I'm saying. Because you don't go for that, you're qualitatively limiting your potential reward sources. And I know what you're thinking. I know you're thinking, oh, but if I know they're going to go for that other thing, then I could get potentially more reward. And the answer is, yeah, you could potentially get more reward, but you also open up less opportunities. And you need to remember, fighting games at, co at their core have an inherent randomness element to them. Because of the whole passage of time aspect and the whole RPS aspect that exists, like, just embedded into the DNA of this genre, the way it is meant to work. Like, you're not going to be right 100% of the time. So you're covering less bases just off the assumption that, you know, oh, I could read that, I could get more damage this way, blah, blah, blah. And you know, for me, that's also true. Like, even for Nadia, this is true to an extent. You could also think that way for Nadia. And for the longest time when I was playing this game at the beginner levels, people always told me, oh, go for the best risk reward. What's the best risk reward? But they never told me how to stack my options with each other to create better risk reward for my overall game plan rather than my individual actions in a vacuum. So when I started playing, I often thought, oh, best risk reward, uh, that has to be super jump in, right? But they never really told me how to, how to thread my smaller neutral options. Now, you know how to do that, and that's good for you because as FCO, as a more neutral slash zoner-based character, you have to make use of all those nuances to really optimize on your reward sourcing, right? Um, but even offense, defense-wise, there's a very similar logic that works at its core. So, my, so for Nadia, a uh, big part of my game plan was doing this, when I was mid level, because you know, uh, I'm expecting super jump to whatever, or this range, I could, up, oh, up, oh, my bad, or I could do this, and uh, I'd be plus, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, or, or for anti airs, I'd be like, oh, I could also do this, right? But for anti airs, I never really thought to do this sometimes, which is kind of ridiculous because, you know, yeah. This, by itself, isn't that great, but you know that at top level, the momentum I get from that is ridiculous. And that is its own reward source. It's not, it's not really, it's not really, uh, hang on. It's not really as, like, crazy as doing this, right? This is obviously the preferable reward if I know it's going to work, but the thing is, you never know 100% of the time if it's going to work. So... Again, with FCL, there's a very similar logic, and a lot of small things I feel you're not utilizing. Like, uh, you know, that, like this, this is one example. Because normally when you're at this spot, you usually go for this, or like this, or you go for this, and then you just start the zoning game all over again at this range, right? Well, I do, really... I do like to position and play with my corner, with the opponent with their back to the corner, though. That is right. like a big thing, because I understand there's nowhere else for them to go. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. can play what is, in essence, my neutral game in a stacked favor for me. Right. It is, it is a stacked favor, but again, if you're going for, like, the same options and you're reward sourcing in the same windows of time the same ways, then I can mitigate that just by the meta knowledge of, you know, knowing, oh, he's going to do this here, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that mitigates, right? I think what if you... I don't do is I never go back in. Yeah, there's that. You never go back in. There's there's another thing. And I don't blame you for that because, you know, you know Nadia 2B is pretty ridiculous. But, but, uh, FCL technically isn't that different from other characters in this regard. And what I mean by that is, uh, remember how I mentioned as Miyako, I had to utilize a lot of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I had to leave myself open for just those, those weird increments that people don't normally do. And that's because I know Zay is focused on, like, instead of being focused on this, he was focused on, or, that's what Zay would have been focused on. By interrupting these windows, I could create, I could use these small nuances to create, you know, new micro opportunities that the opponent's not going to be focused on. So if you do, like, this, or, uh, you know, or, and instead of going for, or instead of going for this twice, why not, why not do this once and play off the expectations that you're going to do this again and maybe go for something like, it's crazy, right? Well, but... there is a couple of inherent issues with that particular sequence, right? Like what? Like the low flicker is minus three. <clears throat> it's minus three. Uh-huh. So, oftentimes I'd rather walk back 
and see how no. the opponent will play and react no. to it. No, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Uh, that's playing reactively. There's a value to playing proactively, even for someone like FCL in the corner, because uh, normally whenever I play, I often block this, right? Like, it doesn't matter if it's plus three, plus whatever. I don't give a fuck about the frame data. Because I'm focused on an expectation. It doesn't matter if this is minus three or minus six or whatever, because if I do this, and look, if you do this as FCL, and you do this immediately after, I know I'm eating a full combo, because if you do uh, one, I'm oh, sorry, if you do one, then you do two, on that two, I know that I don't have any real options that can, like, contest it if you're at the right spot. So I'm, I'm going to be respecting the fuck out of that. You can use that respect and, you know, like, play with the timing aspect a little bit. Well, yeah, to with B Flicker, my yeah. like, lately yeah. I've been trying to use it. Because B Flicker at least is plus, right? Right. And even at a distance, sometimes, oftentimes the expectation is the low Flicker coming after, right? Mm. So I have been messing around with that a bit more. Mm. Like, I, oh. you know, I was playing Naughty the other day, and I was messing around with that quite a bit. So, like, with dashing back in or sneaking back in. But after Low Flicker, I feel like it's way harder to do, because Low Flicker mm. is actually, like, end of turn move in a way. Like, in order for me to really steal frames with that move, I would have to get respect with, like, uh, 63A. Right. Oh, actually, here's another idea. Like, speaking of, like, windows of time, you know what you could do? Instead of doing, like, instead of canceling this into a papa or whatever, you could do, uh, walk back, and, like, look, actually, at this range, walk back. Look, now my 2C is out of range, and 2B is out of range, right? Now I'm going to be thinking, oh, he doesn't have anything which can hit me at this range. This is probably a good idea to try and start escaping. And if, if I escape, like, my dash of puny, right? I, I can't really up bar at this range. And if I escape, then I'm going to have to try to make it back to small wounds, right? But by the time I realize that, by the time you do this, walk back, because I don't know you're going to walk back, or if I don't anticipate the walk back, now I have to play around... Excuse me. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, I have to play around the fact that you're now here, and I'm taking that split second to catch up. As I'm confirming that, I might act automatically again. They're like, oh shit, time to escape. I'm dead. I'm yeah. fucking dead. That is a very good aspect of it because normally in a as the fcl player you use the charge 5c and it does have a single plus frame so you want to like take advantage of it more immediately yeah so i yeah. do really like the idea of walking back because i mean i do that off other stuff too right but right. i don't often do it off of that 5c from that spacing that's mm. true Right, so the, the important thing here is, uh, it, it's good that you play reactively and optimize that well on a character like FCL, but the reason offense is so strong in Melty is because, like, if, if you're doing, like, Frank, like, you know, uh, this, this airtight shit, I can't do anything about that. You have so many branching options off that, that you can use to condition and make the opponent respect you. Like you, have, you have so many options. So many options. And because of that, it's generally better, like no matter what character you're playing, it's generally better to be proactive. And because you have the means to be so proactive in such an unpredictable variety of ways, it's not just walking back and even like doing this or whatever. Like in the same window of time you go for that, you could go for a completely different option. Like like let's say for instance, uh, you do this, you, sorry, you do this, you walk back, and instead of going for this, this, you could also do, like, just, just waiting around here a little bit, right? Yeah, Playing in a different window of time. Or maybe you could, or if I know you're going to play in that window of time, that opens up this again. Or or rather, not, not the throw, but this, you know? Yeah. These, you see how these options cycle, and, like, the small things you're not taking advantage of here, right? Yeah, and I can, you can value use... this a lot more with a lot of yeah. different options that I have. Yeah, a lot of different options, and you can also force the opponent to focus in different ways because of these options. You can force them, and, you know, like, you can force them to look at a lot of uh, different nuances to, uh, in these situations. I mean, um, you're 100% right. I always felt like my offense is my weakest aspect as a player, and it's mm -hmm. not just the character. It's definitely me as a player. Right, and in neutral, uh, whenever we're at about this range, uh, I know you often go for like a lot of the same things because in the past sets we have, I often fall for those same things over and over and over again. Like, and it, it worked because like like let's just say for instance, uh, you whiff all your flicker, and then no, sorry, you whip flicker, uh, fucking you whip flicker, and then you immediately go for like that or something, right? Right, well, be right. flicker though. Yeah, 
Yeah. Right, because if I if I react to aha, he would flicker. I'm gonna jump over yeah. through this. That was that was me having the same problem in a way because I was playing too reactively. I was too focused on the same windows of time and the same options in those same windows of time, those same key situations. But because of that, you could kill me doing shit like this, right? So. Once I became more self-aware to this concept and started studying, okay, how can I possibly take advantage of this? How can I condition the opponent? What can they do to beat me back? Like, let's say, for instance, uh, we're playing this game, and uh, you would flicker, right? But you anticipate I'm not going to jump in because you know I know you're going to do that. And that, that uh, opens up different opportunities for you. Now, I'm not entirely sure what opportunities because I'm not an FCL player, but I know there must be a lot just by the nature of the character's design and Melty as a system. Like, let's say you whiff this, and then you, you do micro-walk, maybe. Like, just, just to bait 2B, just to, just to really get it out there. Yeah. Or, or maybe you do, like, jump, just confirm the situation, maybe. Or, if I'm really respecting you that much, boom! You see what I'm, you see what I'm saying here, right? Yeah. Okay, so there's that. And, uh, you know, remember what I also said about, like, uh, you know, qualitative uh, limits and reward sourcing? Because... On the opposite end of reward sourcing, there's also risk sourcing. Like, let's say, for instance, if uh, I'm at this range, rising jump A is pretty low risk, low commitment overall, because, you know, the odds of someone catching this are pretty low, but that doesn't mean that isn't still there isn't still a risk source to it. Because if the opponent knows that I'm going to... Hang on. So if the opponent knows that I'm going to be doing that in certain situations for whatever reason, they can anticipate that. Oh, fuck it. Hang on. Wrong range. Yeah. No, no. There. Sorry, it's a little hard to input this while I'm, while I'm streaming. So, that's still risk sourcing. There's, there's a bit of risk to everything you do. It's just a matter of how can you, how can you mitigate that risk? based on the opponent's tendencies and how they react to key situations, the layers are working on, and how can you, you know, like, favorably do this and that. You, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, of course. Right, so, uh, that's that's why I say it's important to have variety in your options because, hang on, I really wish there was a, there was a quick yeah, swap option. But that's, like, the part that's difficult because, like, say I do with Flicker and you are on point, I can't mm -hmm. move. No, you can move. You can actually. If uh, I do if I... B like B flicker in neutral, not not A flicker, right? Because A flicker is even right. more recovery. Right. So if you do B flicker neutral, I and you know... if you're on point with your timing, you can force me to block. Like I can't jump. I'll get hit at a jump startup. I mean, yeah, that's true. So but... like I understand that it's not, you know, it's it's not an easy move to completely react to and get a, like a legit whiff punish. So I understand. So there are, that's the reason why I would steal the frames, knowing that I'm anticipating a dash in or something, you know? Right, but the thing here is, uh, that is only with punishable if I'm anticipating it. Because that kind of thing is so, like, it's tight. Yeah, it's, so I, you Like you said, I need to be on point, right? But I'm not always going to be on point. Yeah. You could be doing so many other things in neutral. And again, because of the randomness aspect in here to fighting games alone, I'm not going to be able to pr perfectly predict everything. Now, your job in this case, obviously, is to know what... Oh, whoops, my bad. It's obviously to know when, what, when you know, you whiff, and when you should block and just hold that, or maybe do this. Or, or, you could fuzzy jump. Maybe fuzzy jumping will work. Maybe I'm trying to confirm something else, you know? Well, yeah. So you're telling me just uh, be more cognizant of my options that I can use and be, you know, I'll, I yeah. understand. It's yeah, something in the short that... of it, like, it's, it's not just being cognizant to your options, but actually acting upon them. Because the most important thing with actually learning fighting games is ingraining those new habits and practicing their execution in real matches. Because you can understand something, but if you don't actually practice it, then you're not going to be able to call upon it, upon it like, in a flash, you know? Yeah. So, there's that, you know. And uh, the most important aspect I want you to pay attention to is... Oh, uh, right. Pay attention also to the opponent's reward sourcing. Like, let's just say, uh, for instance, uh, you do, uh, you know, flicker on me. Let's just pretend I'm being pressured on the opponent right now, right? If I do 
something like a bar eight two B, then that inherently means I'm not focused on doing this or fancy jump, right? I'm focused on different nuances, and it's really hard to piece those nuances together because of how tightly they interconnect with all sorts of other options in very very similar windows of time, but still gives you a window of time to work with, right? Like if I'm focused on a bar eight two B at whatever, like maybe uh. Maybe I'm expecting you to do read dash at this range, right? Maybe I'm doing a bar 2B at that point. Or uh, you also say, don't run offense against these characters because skeleton and elves are always just going to mesh, right? But that's not because always, like, that's not because, uh, you know, that's not because we're just b brain dead mashers. It might look that way, and yeah, it often does come off that way. But the truth is, uh, people usually like to come in at the exact same spots and the exact same windows of time. So we just feel, hey, maybe they're going to come in here. I well, should match the, like I should match them, I would right? say my issue with that is the risk reward. Right, the risk like, reward. If you are playing is fucking like, F, If you're playing F Tono, I'm not going to be as worried. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just so, straight up right. if you hit me, it's all right, you hit me, but if you hit me with one of these characters, I could lose the whole game. Yeah. So there's, you know, that's true. That's very true. But you get what I'm saying with regards to like the internal logic of the other player and the options available to them based on the specifics of the game state, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Cool. Cool. So you know, uh, if I had to give you, you know, like actually practical advice going forward, um, you know how to delay our options. What I told Amla, and what I told da like what I told Dabs was. Wait a second later. Like for Dabs' level, I told him if you wait a second later, later and play in the following interaction rather than the ones you're going for, your options will open up. What I told Amla was both that and once you're playing in those different windows of time, don't go for the same rewards you normally go for. Because like, if let's just assume I'm H Kohana, right? And if Amla's standing out here, then maybe he could like wait two seconds. But you know, usually he's gonna be like, oh, uh, I'll I'll set bomb. Uh, no, sorry, yeah, I'll set bomb. I'll I'll do two A. Blah blah blah. It doesn't matter if he's waiting two seconds or five seconds in neutral. He's gonna do that. But instead of doing that, he could also play, you know, at these these different ranges or play a more nuanced whiff punish game. Options that he's not going for. And for you, it's kind of something similar in that. Your, the variety in your options are really good at balancing each other out, but if the opponent knows how to play against that balance, then you need new options. You need to, you know, you need to cultivate uh, even more small things that net you big rewards. Yeah, like, this like is the ones stuff I've been offense. thinking about a lot, and I've been trying. Right. Like my so approaches to... are pretty limited, right? Like if you know right. that when I'm going to be aggressive, it's like, you know, I'm gonna do dash to be. Yeah, so that's and, and that's like, normally that's pretty limited, mm, right? Right. That's normally why I also say like Melty. Like I'm being completely unironic when I say Melty is a skill based game because the thing is, this is how I make bad matchups work somehow by the end of the day. Because uh, again, for example, uh, F Miyako versus F Ryoki, not the worst matchup, but F Miyako is statistically very disadvantaged on paper. Because of how easy it is for F Ryoki to run our game plan and shut her out. Like, it's super, super easy. Um, but the way I make that work is because it, it's, a bal it's, it's a balance of micro versus macro options, too. Because if I'm so focused on all the different macro or micro options, then that leaves me open to my opponent conditioning me in much simpler ways. Like, uh, what was it? Um, because... F Miyako doesn't have the best options in neutral. She has to play a lot with like the nuances. Now I know, uh, uh, JB, uh, JC, uh, Miyako so ignorant. Yeah, cool. But but she's still outranged, and her red only lasts for so long in certain in certain places, right? So the way I make that work is I use the small bits of her toolkit in neutral to make the opponent move in unfavorable ways until eventually I can get to a nice spot where my more macro options tend to work. Like, that that's thats just the reality of this game, you know? There, there's a lot of options, a lot of things you got to hold on to. FCL has something very similar, and if I had to give you, uh, you know, a practically applicable, simple takeaway from all this, um, 
Well, for offense, obviously I told you, make use of walks or like playing at certain spots a little more, and uh, especially in correlation to what you think the opponent's going to do, right? Like, I, 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 I gave you some solid examples. I'm sure you could branch off that. But for neutral, um, I want you to study your fallback habits. I want you to study the automatic habits you have when things don't go right. And I want you to study, hey, what could I be doing in this situation instead? Because my opponent is so focused on, uh, you know, me doing something automatically in reaction to my, my uh, conscious strategy not working, but that leaves them open to something. So what's favorable to do in a situation where they're anticipating, uh, you know, what I'm going to do in after like maybe whip and flicker if if i'm anticipating for instance that you're going to do this i'm not going to go in and that leaves me open to a lot of things that you can do in return right and there's a lot of habits like that you have in your so tool, which... it's more nuance that is only going to come up against better players really it's that's true but the thing about lower level players is that to an extent you can do this to them too to an extent because the thing is if you do this correctly uh if you do this correctly, like, let's just say you do do, uh, you know, 5C, I block it, then you walk out a little bit. Of course. What's that going to do versus, like, lower This shit's going right? to work against everyone, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. I just mean, like, the that... neutral concepts, because a lot of times, like, you know, a situation will play out to its natural state. Like, you know, you, you do X, they're going to do Y. Yeah. So it's going to take a different kind of a player to think beyond that. Mm-hmm. Oh, also, uh... For reference, uh, I know you don't really play other character, but I'm going to show myself a little here, but I actually do want you to look at my last uh, Lunar Phage footage versus Skeleton. What changed between... Oh, excuse me. Hold up. Food. Okay. So, what changed between the first set and the reset for Grand Finals was simple, because my... My C Tono, like, no matter how nice the neutral is or whatever, is ultimately pretty, like, uh, there, there's, it's fairly unoptimized. Pressure and conversion-wise, yeah. there's a lot left to be desired, right? But uh, also in neutral, there are still a lot of nuances I could be taking advantage of. But notice how even with that, how in the grand final set, I went for different options in different windows of time and conditioned Skeleton that way. I'm using the same toolkit I have just in a radically different way that affects the mental game. That's yeah. the really hard thing to see with fighting games, too, because it's someone could be making really small adjustments, and their overall play might not be any better, but in the context of the mind game they're playing, or, like, the game state in particular, plus the mind game, it could be it could make really huge differences in practice. And that's ultimately what I was doing versus Skeleton, too. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's always been apparent the way you structure your offense is really strong. Mm, and it's not just the fucking, you know, you're not just doing non EO mix ups. You're doing strike delays. throw shit with fucking. Yeah, delays, you know. ranges, anticipation, even, even like micro walks or like playing off the delay off the micro walks, et cetera, et cetera. You know? Yeah. A lot of options in this game that a lot of players still haven't explored. I, I mean that. Yeah, definitely. Like the skills. The skill ceiling in this game is actually fucking ridiculous. Yeah, that was a, the other thing you brought up earlier with the spacing shit, because it's like I always do that shit, but I'm realizing I was doing it against Nani at the wrong space. Right. Like, against oh. other characters, it's a little different because my toolkit works differently against them, you know? Right. So, so it's a matter... So basically, in short, like, in, in summary, it's a matter of being creative with your small, like, you know, small changes to make big changes. And it's also a matter of being as variable about it as possible because you get to reward source way more the more you make that a habit. And the more you... <coughs> excuse me. And the more you familiarize yourself with these tools, the more options you have the more you can quickly recognize these game states and how to quickly change between tactics, you're going to have a huge technical and mental advantage over your opponent. Because if they're... Because if the opponent, like, let's say, for instance, uh, I'm a mid-level Nania player. Oh, I'm so focused on... Oh, this. I'm so focused on DP. I'm so focused on uh, MASH. I'm so focused on Joe. Oh, Epic, right? You know how to deal with that. If you were to fight a mid-level Nania player, you'd likely blow them the fuck up for all that, right? 
But you know, I do it differently because I'm playing in <laughs> different windows of time. You know, smaller. I'm making better use of smaller yeah. nuances. It's harder to person, know what yeah. you're going to do. And, and when up. I'm going to do it and why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, And yeah. it makes it harder to run the, the generic game plan. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You're, you're deconstructing and reconstructing that game plan to significantly different effects. But holy shit, it's definitely harder against Nanya than it is against Satsuki. Oh, I agree, for example. 100%. Like, just I'm because not going to deny that. I will say that be FCL's toolkit works much stronger against Satsuki, for example. Yeah, just because... For sure. It's easier to counter poke an incoming dash. Mm -hmm. Like, Nania having the disjoint where, he, you know, whatever the fuck it is with his 2B, it opens up yeah. so much and it makes the neutral way more chaotic. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely not gonna... I'm definitely not gonna hold you on that. There's a reason I say, aside from maybe damage, and reads, I don't think my bro. character has any weaknesses whatsoever. And, like, Nania can make reads on CL in neutral that just fucking obliterate her. Like, you can just slide under Flicker if you really yeah. wanted to. Like, even if not a whiff punish, you just do it. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh, uh, and, and similarly, that's also something else when I was starting out that I really wish people didn't lie to me about. Because, you know, when I'm running offensive board, I'm like, oh, go, go for the thing that goes for immediate reward. But now, sometimes, I just do this. You know why? Because it fucks with their anticipation. And I get your reward source on the next window of time differently. Like, yeah. that's that's the layers we're working on here. Yeah, I mean, with Ciel, it's that's how I have to do it. Like, her generic offensive structure is not going to work on this version yeah. of the game. Mm -hmm. Like, her command grab is not effective. The overhead mix-up is very, like, it's pretty mediocre. Yeah. In PC, at least. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's that's for sure. So, learning how to, like, like, I do a lot of this shit, right? Like, I'll do, like, a 2A into, like, a stand into another 2A, you know? Or yeah. 5B walk back and all, all of this weird shit. Trying to get advantage off of, you know, a minus button, like a 2B or something. Mm. But... I definitely can further that exponentially. There's so much more to do, even with mm -hmm. an F Moon character. A lot of times I'll say, like, oh, F Moon, they can't rebeat, you know? Like, yeah, if you I think know. about, like, Crescent CL, she can take every button that FCL has and then also rebeat it or use specials or go to another button. So right. I always feel like her pressure is way less linear. Oh, yeah, for sure. But even with that said, I never maximize the character's offense. A lot of the times, I'll even say, like, when I watch old videos, like, of Zar playing in PS2, I always feel like he understood these concepts you're saying way better than I did. Because mm. he would do a lot of unique things like that. So, I, right. I mean, I, I can't lie. Because that's, like, a, the big thing. is like, how many times do I win neutral and then I just fucking lose? And like a lot of times, it, it it's on me. Mm. There's so much more I could do. Even like I would give like credit to Luther is with for that too. Sometimes like I think your offense is like way crazier, but right. I always appreciated how much Luther could do with like just like a basic two A. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, one more, one more thing. Just one more thing. Uh, you know that. Unblockable mix up that uh, Tono had in Type Luna, right? How he could mix up between, like, you know, this, like, let's just assume this is Type Luna, and I'm doing my Unblockable 5C, right? And how I could mix that up with the low, and and the opponent's anticipation of having to high shield it, right? Okay. Yeah, so there was an OS that people would use to blow that up, because if they anticipate 5C, then they could they could OS in a way that makes it clash with the clash frames and then leave me to be fucked over by the recovery, right? You know how I got that mix-up to work anyway despite the OS? I changed their anticipation on the window of time. Like, let's say, for example... Actually, hang on. Let me actually use Tono to exemplify this. So normally in type Lumina, uh, people like to do uh, five scene block pool at this spot, right? Yeah. But like after after reading, they they like to do that, and uh, you know most players will OS at that point. They'll be like, oh, he's gonna he's gonna do the charge up animation. He's gonna do the charge five C animation. Once they see that charge five C animation, then they start mentally preparing the OS. But you know what I did to blow that up? I did this. 
I waited a microsecond, and then I did this. And that fucked them up. Now, it's funny because you would expect that blow up to, uh, OS to blow up everything, provided it's timed right. But even with that, you can fuck up their anticipation and execution just by understanding what they're thinking in these small windows of time. And I understood that they were thinking, I'm going to look for 5C in the spot, because they always look for 5C in the spot. Yeah. I, I made them look for 5C in the spot. I gotta say one thing, though. My big issue when I'm playing against you as opposed to other players is I'm doing a lot of shit like this against other people, right? But when uh -huh. I'm playing against you, I'm just like, you know, especially in tournament setting, right? I'm just like, all right, either I'm go like I'm going to fucking die, right? So a lot of times I keep it way too simple against you, uh -huh. or or I try to like I'm overextending in like a bad way. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like I never get to run the <laughs> offense that I run against other people. Right. But right. I think it's like a mental block in a way. Like uh, it's a mental and experience block together because obviously the more you play a game, the more you understand the situations, the more quickly you can react to it just by attrition being in your blood at that point. And for me, often when I play this game, I'm able to recognize a majority of situations really, really quickly and what layers I should be going for technically and mentally just because I've, like, played it that much. For you, I think it's a very similar thing. It's just, like, grinding. That's that's just the aspect you, aspect you got to grind out, I feel. Yeah, I think that we probably don't play often enough. Yeah, definitely not. And, you know... All of uh, us like in I... general. Like, all the people who are good at the game, we don't play each other enough. Yeah, and there's also the fact that, uh, you know, um, at top level, we also only get so much variety, which is why we play so many different characters, because Melty is a very general game by the end of the day. Like, yeah, sure, he may mix up, uh, no, he may neutral, uh, Neuro Ignorance, F Bucky, bullshit, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, cool. But the decision making and understanding. It's homogenized itself, a lot of the time, yeah. A lot of still, the characters. It's still very are general, yeah. Playing so, similar. Mm hmm. See my so, Sui, bro. Yeah, that's that's why I don't really play Naya nowadays unless I really gotta get ready for something big. And even then, when I enter crossover, I'm gonna be using fucking Miyako. <laughs> I mean, do whatever you want, man. Whatever gives you a thrill. That's what I'm doing it for, yeah. Yeah, I um, mean, yeah, personally, I do... I enjoy playing a lot of the roster in this game, too. Mm. But again, it's just for kicks more than anything for me. True. Anyway, uh, so my lesson here is basically done. You you understand everything I told you, and the most important key takeaways, right? Oh yeah. The, the key takeaways being like you know. Uh, it's the make, little uh, shit, man. Yeah, yeah, it's the little shit, and the actual immediate like the things you can immediately start working on is like you know for neutral, neutral timings. Yeah, no, for neutral it's not just timings, but see what ha see what you normally do when you fail, and then notice what the opponent does to you, try to counter that, and then you know like study what else you can do based off that anticipation. That's for neutral. Yeah. It's and... stuff I've been trying, but it's again it's important to you know right put it really in front of me and let me know. Mm -hmm. And then for offense, as I said, you know a lot of small things, different spacings, different timings, different you know small things, blah blah blah. Yeah, you get it, you get it. Okay, cool. You're done. All you right, cool, it. dude. I think this is pretty fruitful. What do you think if I fucking upload this? I think oh, it could be fruitful you... for people. Oh, were you recording that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, Go ahead. It was pretty informal, but I mean, if I don't help people, then go for it. Yeah, I mean, whatever, dude. If they want to... It, it's something that you probably won't get to hear. If yeah, you, it's you know. definitely not something I hear any players talking about. And it's something... That's gonna go beyond like mid level shit in a yeah, way. Yeah, it's beyond mid level, beyond Melty itself, even. Yeah, it's a very. Because the thing with Melty Blood that I feel it's like you have to learn all of these Melty Blood fundamentals before you could even understand these concepts. Yeah. I really think Actually, that. Like, yeah. Because in yeah. fighting games, like, you know, when you're Ryu, you throw a fireball. If they jump, you sure you can, you know, and you know your fucking normal spacings. But then with Melty Blood, there's so many other variables. <laughs> before you can uh, even get to the point where you can think about like high level baits and mm -hmm. old, you know it's fucking crazy I, I get what you mean yeah. yeah so i think it was pretty interesting so i think this could be you know someone will fucking get something from this shit mm. it's not that long either how long was that actually um, 54 minutes oh jesus we, that's we not bad it was fucking it's, great so i mean worse, i'll yeah. cut it here then 
Okay. Let's call it a That's day. Good. Let's go get some food and uh, enjoy. Hey, pleasure doing business with you as always, yeah. JG. Johnny I'll talk Greece. to you later, my friend. I'll deal later. All right, peace.